justice, even when it was unwelcome. Who will hear their message? Responding to God's call, Jesus traveled, preaching and teaching all who would listen. Who will hear God's message? We will listen and we will hear. Christ sent out disciples, two by two, to spread the good news. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. God's prophets are among us still, around the world and in these pews. Who will hear their message? I invite you all to um, join us in the passing of the tea. We also 
also hold high members of the Jewish faith who are preparing to celebrate Rosh Hashanah and are entering their season of high holy days. Um, one last announcement on the back of the bulletin, you'll notice that worship next week begins at 11 a.m. Again, welcome, and may God be with you. Scripture of the other day comes from Luke 19, 41 to 44. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you unto, unto every stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Truly it is an honor and a pleasure to be in this holy place at this time. Um, certainly I want to wish the preacher who was supposed to be here a speedy recovery back to full health and restoration. But it is truly an honor to stand here uh, in his stead to preach a word this morning. So thank you, Reverend, Ta Reverend Chad, for the, uh, for, the, for the late night email. <laughs> and certainly to the, to the worship team uh, and for uh, the, the humble way that you all have welcomed me into this space. Well, let's get right into it. This passage that was just read in your hearing, it's pretty difficult for me to read and at the same time a little bit comforting because it makes me feel as though Jesus understands what I'm feeling like right now. I've been in a funk since the election of one Donald Trump. I mean, I really have been down. I, I, I've been, I have been surfing along a wave with an undercurrent of melancholy. Some days are better than others, but just underneath the surface of every day has been this malaise, this, this constant sense of dread and despair, this, this unceasing sense that, that not only is something wrong, but that the something that is wrong is permanently so and perhaps has always been so. That perhaps the previous eight years had been but a mirage, a dream, a respite, a short, tiny, small reprieve from the reality that is the absurdity of the American experience. And I find myself really thinking to, your, to myself, Teddy, get a grip, man. We've been down this road before. I mean, at the end of the day, it really is just politics. Why is this one person, this one figure, so important that he has altered your emotional state for months? I make no claims to the contrary. I am a Democrat. I'm an avowed Democrat. I don't say that because you all must be. I have friends who are Republicans. Yeah, I have a couple of token Republican friends that I, keep in, <laughs> that I keep in my pocket just to make sure that I can say that when I preach. But, <laughs> but I remember what it felt like when Bush won. I remember what it felt like to go through those, those weeks of uncertainty of not knowing what the Supreme Court would do. I remember watching CNN and watching them lift up these cars with these hanging chads. Y'all remember that? 
We went weeks looking at these, these different kind of voter cards from different counties in Florida. It's like everybody knew every name of every county in Florida. I remember when he won, I remember being disappointed, but I don't remember being depressed. I remember even feeling a little bit of, of, of hope. I remember feeling like maybe there was a chance to work with him. He had run on a, on a platform of compassionate conservatism. And in my family, an immigrant family from Panama, we even had some hope because he, he had promised to rectify the immigration rules and we were hoping that maybe, just maybe, my cousin Carlos would finally get his papers after waiting for 10 years. Of course, we did not know at that time he would have to wait 16 more. We did not know that he would go on to wage two wars and bankrupt the country, lead to the crashing of an economy. We knew none of that at the time, but it did not depress me to lose. And so why this time? Why this moment? And I think it's because of the brazen, open, really honest way that Trump traded upon the country's legacy of white supremacy and the, the deep-seated undercurrent of racism that pervades through our country, the xenophobia that, that captures so much of our politics, the anxiety with which we can always get some people to betray their kinship with other people, the way we can always get our, our country to, to, to break itself apart in you and me between us and them, the way that he was so honest about what politicians are usually so sly and quiet about. And I look around the country, and I'm arrested. I'm arrested by the fear and trembling with which people that I care about feel so threatened on so many levels, on so many fronts. And I'm embarrassed to say that this feeling has been paralyzing for me. That on way too many mornings, all I want to do is lay in the bed and pull the covers up over my head. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't watch the news much anymore. I don't want to be informed. I don't want to know what he said yesterday. I don't want to know what Bill is going through Congress at the moment. I, I don't want to know what the commentators are saying. I don't want to know what the pollsters are predicting about the midterms of 2018. I'm a political junkie. I read every single book, every blog, every article, every think piece. But for the last eight or nine months, I have stopped all of that because I used to believe that by staying engaged and by working and pushing and prodding and preaching and teaching and advocating, by canvassing my neighborhood, by knocking on doors, by talking about the issues, by voting at the polls, I thought I could make a difference. Amen. But now when I look at the situation that we're in, when I see the blatant incompetence of this man and see that his base remains solid, immovable, not a majority, but just enough to continue winning. Sometimes I just look at the whole situation and all I can do is muster a tear rolling down my face. And so I read this passage and I'm at least comforted that Jesus knows what this feels like. But I'm also further depressed at the reasons why he knows what this feels like. He comes up over the hill of the Mount of Olives. He looks down and he looks at the city of Jerusalem and he sees what Jerusalem has become and all he can do is cry. He sees a city that should have been a city on a hill a city that was supposed to represent to the world the shalom of God. A city that was supposed to show the world what God's will and way looked like. A city that was supposed to show the world the beauty of holiness. But he looks down and he says, if only, if only you, Israel, had recognized on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you 
and hem you in on every side. They will, not that they might, but they will crush you to the ground. You and your children within you, not just today, but tomorrow, not just your present, but your future, will be hemmed in and they will not leave within you, not one. They will not leave one stone upon the other because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. They are hidden from your eyes. Jesus is looking at his city and he's saying, the die has been cast. Your fate has been sealed. It's over for you. Your destruction is imminent. You will succumb to your enemy because you could not see the peace of God when it came in your midst. You could not even recognize the opportunity to chase after shalom that God was giving you. you Jesus looks at this state of affairs and he just cries. There's nothing left. No hope. We have to understand how Israel got there. This is a story, this, this Bible of ours, about a particular people who lived in parts of Africa and Asia along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea a story of their ancestors of prophets and priests, poets and kings, a story about their history, and for the majority of that history, they were a people at war. The Bible is a collection of stories, prophecies, hymns, wisdom literature, mythical visions, and testimonies that come from a people who were constantly, constantly at war. Out of the thousands of years recorded in the scriptures, only about 40 of those years were peaceful ones for Israel. Think about that. 400 years of slavery. 40 more years of wandering in a desert. Finally getting to the promised land only to spend 100 more years fighting with the inhabitants that are already there. You finally get a king and you spend 20 years fighting trying to pretend you are a country. You finally get the great promised king, David, and for 40 years David wins battles, but it's still a fight every single day trying to prove that they are somebody. And then Solomon comes, and for 40 great years they have peace. But the peace is short-lived. For as soon as Solomon exits, exits the stage, civil war breaks out and 200 more years of fighting brother against brother, sister against sister. Hemmed in on every side by empires warring for their territory. Egyptians on one side, Assyrians on the other. Northern Israel falls to Assyria, southern Israel falls to Babylon, exiled for 40 more years. They come out of that and spend the next centuries in servitude and slavery and in vassals to the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, and failed rebellion after failed rebellion after failed rebellion. The story is about the devastating impact of war on physical bodies, yes. For they suffered actual death, they suffered slavery and servitude, they suffered under the strong man politics and strong man economics. They suffered physically, but more than that, it's a story about the long-lasting impact of war on the social body that was Israel. The impact of war on the imagination. The impact of constant war on their capacity to envision a reality beyond the construct of domination and subordination. A mentality that lasts long after the armistice is reached and long after the treaties have been signed. War brings about a mentality that makes you think the only option in life is to be on the bottom or the top of a system that is perpetually unequal and hopelessly unjust. A life that says when all else fails, your objective in this world is simply to win. And you get to the point where you can't see any different. You can't even imagine it. Jesus says, you did not recognize God. The war mentality, the way of thinking about the world that says someone must always be on the top, someone must always be on the bottom. 
that there must always be someone excluded in order for someone else to flourish, that in order for one group of people to feel as if things are great again, other groups of people must be shoved out, pushed away, enclosed back onto the margins where they belong. This mentality is so sick that it makes us incapable of seeing the possibility of wholeness, the possibility of well-being for everyone, the possibility that God is indeed moving in our midst and that there is a chance, just a chance, that if we would follow the way of God, that we might experience the beauty of holiness that God created once again. This mentality that we have, it arrests us and it causes us to despair. And Jesus shows that in those moments, sometimes all that's left is a tear running down your face. Jesus looked at Jerusalem and cried. So what do you do? What do you do when the despair around you causes you to be hopeless? What do you do when you realize that the world is hopelessly committed to this narrative of domination, this narrative of subordination? What do you do when you realize that people are so far away from even imagining peace, much less pursuing it and achieving it? Well, the first step is to do as Jesus did, which is to be honest about the feelings, not to hide them, not to pretend. Jesus cried, Jesus grieved, Jesus named it. He called it out and said, you all are missing the mark, and because you are missing the mark, your demise is imminent. Jesus did not shy away from the painful reality of how deep the problem was. He did not fool himself. He did not fail to tell the truth, and he also did not fail to acknowledge how hurtful and harmful and painful it was. Jesus cried over the city. But then, in verse 45, Jesus didn't stay crying. It says that he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And then it says that every day he was teaching in the temple. Every day he was teaching in the temple. Jesus, right after he says it's hopeless, right after he says the die has been cast, Right after he points out to them how deep their depravity is. Right after he says that Shalom is so far away from their grasp. Right after he says that they missed it. Jesus goes into Jerusalem and gets to work. Jesus goes into Jerusalem to the heart of the economic center, to the heart of the political center, to the heart of the religious center, and begins to agitate and move and motivate and protest and shake things up. Jesus begins to make himself a nuisance. Jesus begins to raise a ruckus. Jesus begins to make himself an enemy of the state. Jesus begins to piss off the powers that be. Jesus doesn't stay crying, but he gets up the next day marching. Jesus didn't stay crying, but he got up the next day preaching. Jesus didn't stay crying, but he got up the next day moving. Jesus didn't stay crying, but he got up the next day mobilizing. Jesus didn't stay crying, he got up the next day working and waging for peace in the city. But Jesus didn't just motivate and mobilize and protest and agitate. He also taught Bible study. <laughs> Every day. Yes. Yes, he had a great big show. Yes, he had a well-planned, well-orchestrated, and well-executed action of Nonviolent protests. I don't know how nonviolent it was. It says he, he drove them to the temple. <laughs> yeah, might not have been all that nonviolent. He might have been called a domestic terrorist. But he didn't just protest. He then went on to what we would call works of piety. Every day he taught Bible study. Every day he prayed in the temple. Every day he preached. 
Every day he concerned himself with the word of God and the people of God. Jesus, Jesus wasn't naive. Jesus wasn't a, just an optimist. Jesus had something better than optimism. Jesus had a purpose. Jesus had a mission. Jesus had something inside of him that told him who he was and what he ought to be doing. This same Jesus who with clear-eyed analysis was able to look at the city and say, you have missed the shalom. This same Jesus also said that in spite of it all, the Spirit of the Lord is still upon me. The Spirit of the Lord has still anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, I've got a purpose that must persist in the face of all of the problems. I must still preach recovery of sight to the blind. I still got to work on letting the oppressed go free. I still have to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor because that's what I was created and made to do. There's a, there's a story of a woman who lived by the beach for some reason, the beach started washing up starfish by the hundreds, then by the thousands. Soon the beach was infested with these starfish that were flopping around and dying every day. The woman, moved by compassion, went out to the beach and began to throw the starfish as far as she could out into the ocean. And she would work day and night. She would start early in the morning and work until her feet could no longer move, her hands could no longer pick up the starfish. She would get a good night's sleep and go back out the next day and begin to throw the starfish out again. Finally, one of her neighbors went out to meet her and said, what are you doing? She said, I'm trying to throw the starfish back into the ocean. Won't you help me? And they said, why would we help you? It's a pointless endeavor. This exercise is futile. There are too many starfish. The work is overwhelming. Every day you throw a couple hundred back into the water, and every morning the sea brings us back a couple thousand more. It is pointless what you are doing. Why are you doing this? She said, I'm doing it to save the starfish's life. And he said to her, but what you are doing does not matter. She bent down picked up a starfish, and threw it out into the ocean. She looked at her neighbor and said, it mattered to that one. Yeah. Some of you are here because you are motivated and passionate about social justice. You want to make a difference in the world. You want to go somewhere and shake some things up. You want to go out into the world and agitate and motivate people to, to make a different future than exists today. You want to go out into the world and make sure that people are well cared for. You want to go out into the world and share with everyone that our political structures, our economic structures, our cultural structures are oppressive and demonic and need to be returned turned around and we need to become a people of wholeness and justice and love and beauty. Some of you are here because you're going to go out and you're going to shake the world upside down. Some of you are here because you are called to preach and teach. Because you are called to pray and counsel. Because you are called to sit with people who are dying in a hospital so that they don't have to die alone. It doesn't matter which one of those kinds of callings you're here for. Jesus Jesus didn't believe those two were mutually exclusive. In the face of overwhelming hopelessness, Jesus went and he motivated for social change and he also prayed in the temple. Some of you are here because that is your purpose. And you wake up every day and you cry and you wonder if your purpose means anything at all in the face of this overwhelming depravity of our culture and our society. And I'm here to tell you that in spite of it all, you are still called. In spite of it all, God has still anointed you. In spite of it all, you still have to wake up tomorrow and go to work because the forces of war making will make war. They will continue and they will persist and they will ferociously wage war every single day. And so those of us who have been called to make peace, to make peace through our work, to make peace through our words, to make peace through the arts, to make peace through our preaching, to make peace through our mobilizing, those of us who have been called to wage peace must wake up every single day single morning and continue to wage peace because though we are working against a wave 
of sadness and injustice and intolerance, we are able to pick up the one starfish and throw it back. That every day I've got breath in my body, I can wake up and I can mobilize, I can wake up and I can pray, I can wake up and I can love somebody, I can wake up and I can hold somebody's hand, I can wake up and I can continue to press for the shalom of God in the world because that is what I was created to be. That is what I was created to do. And so long as I have breath in my body, I will continue to wage peace. It's not about effectiveness, but about my faithfulness. I will continue every day to wage war and to make wage peace in the morning. I will wage peace in the noontime. I will wage peace in the evening. I will wage peace in the afternoon. I will wage peace so long as I can wake up in the morning because Jesus, my Savior, has to this work and nobody, nobody is going to turn me around. There's an old spiritual that says we who believe in freedom shall not rest. We who believe in freedom shall not rest until it comes. I know it's hard and I know you wake up some days just wanting to cry. I've been there. The good news is so has Jesus and we know that in spite of it, we cannot rest. We keep waking up we keep turning over tables, and we keep teaching Bible study. Amen.
praying especially in awareness of our Jewish siblings as they enter their season of high holy days. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord.
air, the earth, the oceans, the sky. And now we sit here today and we bring to you our confusion and our doubts and our fears. God of all creation, hear our prayer. Hear us as we lift up Mexico in the aftermath of yet another earthquake. Hear us as we cry out for our families in Puerto Rico who are at this very moment in danger from a hurricane less than two weeks after a hurricane. Continue to be a source of, source of strength for all who are rebuilding in Cuba and in Texas and in Florida, in Barbuda and all places where natural disaster threatens an already fragile existence. We pray that you answer us when we call out to you and hear us even in our doubts. God, break through our loneliness and our fear to quiet our hearts and our minds. Fill us with your peace. Porque tengo miedo. No sé si por falta de fe Señor, ayúdanos a entender que el día de su lucha y guarda las vidas de sus niños. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Amen. Amen.
city. Jesus wept over it. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And every day he was teaching in the temple. Now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, may it rest for you and abide with each and every one of us, now henceforth and forevermore. And the people of God together say, Amen.